Good day and welcome to Fitbit's first quarter 2019 earnings conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Tom Hudson, SVP of Finance. Please go ahead, sir. Good afternoon and welcome. Fitbit distributed a press release detailing its quarterly results earlier this afternoon. It's posted on our website at www.fitbit.com and available from normal financial news sources. This conference call is being webcast live on the IR page of our website where a replay will be archived. On this call, all financial measures are presented on a non-GAAP basis, except for revenue, which is a GAAP measure. A reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP financial measures is provided in our post-earnings release or in other earnings presentation materials posted on the IR page of our website. Growth references will be to a year-over-year comparison unless specified otherwise. This conference call will contain forward-looking information which is subject to risks and uncertainties described in Fitbit's filings with the SEC and in today's press release. Actual results or events may differ materially. We will begin with commentary from James and Ron, and we'll then open up the call to questions. Let me introduce Fitbit's chairman and CEO, James Park. James? Thank you, Tom. Thank you to everyone participating in today's call. I'm really pleased with our performance in Q1. We saw continued momentum across the business and demonstrated that our focus and execution are leading to better results. Revenue is up 10% to $272 million and above our guidance. Device growth accelerated from the positive inflection in the fourth quarter, up 36% year over year to 2.9 million devices sold. Smartwatches sold increased 117% and trackers sold increased 17% year over year. This marks the first quarter of positive year over year growth of trackers since Q3 2016. Smartwatches comprised 42% of revenue, up from 30% of revenue a year ago. As part of our strategy of launching more affordable and accessible devices, we continue to grow our community of active users. Revenue from Fitbit Health Solutions also increased 70%, 30.5 million, and represented 11% of total revenue. Our strategy for long-term growth and profitability in a consumer business is to more effectively monetize our community of active users. Customer acquisition is the first step. We do this today primarily through devices, which is why it's important we continue to deliver products that resonate with consumers, enterprise, and healthcare customers. The 36% growth of devices sold was driven in part by the launch of our new products, Spire HR, Inspire, and Fitbit Versa Lite. Trackers have always been key to our portfolio, and we continue to see a clear segment of users who prefer this form factor. In fact, Inspire HR is currently the best-selling device in the U.S. and retail channel, ahead of Samsung, Fossil, and Garmin. The Inspire launch helped reverse the decline in trackers, and we intend to begin shipping the upgrade for our kids' offering, ACE2, in Q2, further supporting our expected growth in trackers looking forward. In addition, our smartwatch franchise continued to grow faster than the industry, helping Fitbit gain market share. Wired Magazine said about Versa Lite Edition, quote, if it's wrong to make one of the most popular products, Versa, incrementally more useful, attractive, and affordable, and I don't want to be right. The initial Versalite sell-through has been lower than expected, but increased overall awareness and helped drive greater growth in smartwatches in Q1 and helped us engage with a key younger audience. The revenue trajectory of our business has historically been predicated on new product introductions. As these products get introduced, we can bring new users into our community, stimulate previously inactive consumers to buy a new device, or convince existing users to upgrade their device. 67% of revenue in Q1 was driven by new products introduced in the last 12 months. 39% of activations came from repeat users. Of these repeat users, 53% came from users who were inactive for 90 days or more. Across products, we believe there is still a significant upgrade opportunity with approximately 70% of our active users on a legacy device. With growth in devices sold, we are succeeding in getting more users onto the Fitbit platform. This is also due to our innovation in software, ensuring it is fun and engaging to the end user. For example, our recent partnership with Snap to launch the first Bitmoji smartwatch clock face that dynamically changes with you and your activity is a good example of how our software experiences play an important role in keeping our users motivated and engaged. This clock face quickly became one of the top Fitbit clock faces and was downloaded over 320,000 times in the first few weeks of availability. This gives consumers a fun way to personalize their device and get motivated to move more and be healthy. 
As a result of getting more people onto the Fitbit platform, our active user number also increased in the quarter. This raises our confidence as we move to a commercial launch of our premium subscription service planned later this year. We are continuing to test this experience and expect to broaden testing to more of our users over the next several months to get feedback and iterate ahead of our expected commercial launch. We believe we can begin to reduce the volatility and seasonality of our business by adding higher margin or consistent sources of revenue by delivering value that drives behavior change. The growth and importance of Fitbit Health Solutions further supports this opportunity. FHS revenue tends to be front-end loaded, centered around health plan wins and benefit cycles versus our more traditional consumer device business, which is skewed towards the holidays. Fitbit Health Solutions revenue grew 70% in Q1 to $30.5 million. Revenue growth was driven by robust international growth from key enterprise customer wins, strong execution in the U.S. Our FHS business is predominantly device-centric today, but without the channel margin discount, these sales are more profitable than a consumer device business sold into the retail channel. We continue to make steady traction on our Fitbit Care software services platform. Fitbit Care is a health behavior change platform for enterprise populations that delivers meaningful and measurable health outcomes. We saw promising results that demonstrate Fitbit's ability to drive behavior change through analysis of more than 1,700 people who enrolled in the National Diabetes Prevention Program through our partner, Solera Health. Solera found that participants who redeemed the Fitbit device were more active and lost more weight during the program than those who did not and were more likely to be engaged in the platform a year later. In addition, throughout the year, participants who utilized the Fitbit device reported more average minutes of weekly activity than those participants who did not redeem a Fitbit device, with at least 60 more minutes on average during weeks 10 to 52 of the program. Highlighting the growing software opportunity within the FHS platform, I'm also pleased to report that three major health plans are now using Fitbit Care and our devices for diabetes management. Fitbit is committed to returning to growth and profitability, but we want to balance investment to drive future revenue growth with near-term cost savings. We continue to focus on driving operating leverage into the business with an effort to improve both our top line and reduce costs. Operating expenses declined 13% in the first quarter, while we continue to invest in Fitbit Health Solutions, consumer software and services, and our devices product roadmap. With that, let me turn the call over to Ron to discuss our financials in more detail. Ron? Thanks, James. My prepared remarks will focus on a financial overview of the first quarter. I will then provide our guidance for the second quarter and fiscal year 2019. Before I go through the details, I would like to remind investors that financial references are non-GAAP measures except for revenue, and gross references represent year-over-year -year changes unless I specify otherwise. Fitbit sold 2.9 million devices, up 36%, with growth of smartwatches up 117% and trackers increasing 17%. We generated $272 million of revenue, up 10%, as the growth in devices sold was offset by a decline in average selling price to $91. As we refreshed our product portfolio and increased the accessibility of our platform with fun and easy-to-use devices, consumer demand improved. Smartwatches grew to 42% of our revenue in the first quarter, marginally less than in Q4 with the rollout of multiple tracker devices this quarter. The Fitbit Health Solutions business grew 70% to $30.5 million in revenue. FHS revenue tends to have the opposite seasonality of our consumer device business, with revenue skewed toward the first half of the year rather than holiday periods. Over time, as it becomes a larger percentage of our business, we believe it can lessen revenue and cash flow seasonality. U.S. revenue declined 3% to $135 million, and international revenue grew 26% to $137 million. EMEA revenue grew 35% to $87 million. APAC revenue grew 24% to $34 million. And America's revenue, excluding the U.S., declined 5% to $15 million. The international market benefited from the introduction of our new products and the recovery in the U.K. market. Our direct business represented 11% of sales, and we exited the year with a relatively clean global channel. New products introduced in the past 12 months represented 67% of Q1 revenue, compared to 33% a year ago. 
similar to the year-ago period, non-device consumer revenue represented approximately 1% of sales. Gross margin declined 1,290 basis points in Q1, in line with our expectations. The decline in gross margin appeared greater than normal, driven by two one-time events in Q1 2018. Excluding a one-time revenue reserve reversal associated with a credit insurance claim and a warranty accrual reversal, gross margin declined 690 basis points. The 690 basis point decline was primarily driven by the increase in smartwatch revenue as a percentage of total revenue and the initial lower yield in Versa Lite following its product launch. Operating expenses declined 13% to $151 million and were 55% of revenue, down from 70% of revenue a year ago. We are continuing our commitment to drive greater expense discipline in the business and remain on track to deliver our full year operating expense guidance. A portion of the Q1 decline in expenses was the result of a change in the timing of spend rather than additional savings. We shifted approximately $15 million of spend to later in the year. In addition, we took a $2.5 million restructuring charge in the first quarter related to a reduction in staff. Our non-GAAP results excluded this restructuring charge. Research and development costs were $64 million, down 15% due to lower employee costs with lower prototype and consulting expenses. Sales and marketing costs were $65 million, down 5%, as we shifted some media spend from Q1 to Q2 and experienced lower customer service costs. General and administrative costs were $23 million, down 27%. DNA costs primarily benefited from lower cost of litigation and the shift in legal spend to the second half of the year. An additional reduction in our real estate footprint in San Francisco also contributed to lower rent expense. We generated an operating loss of $58 million, which was offset by $5 million of interest and other income for a pre-tax loss $53 million. Our tax rate was 28.3%, resulting in a $15 million benefit, and our net loss per share was $0.15. Cents. Capital expenditures were $6 million, or 2.2% of revenue. Much of the investment in tooling equipment to launch our new products will occur in the second quarter rather than the first quarter. The change in working capital resulted in a use of cash of $33 million, driven by an increase in inventory and accounts receivable. Free cash flow in the quarter was negative $74 million. We ended the quarter with $644 million in cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities on our balance sheet, and no debt. Now let me turn and address our guidance. For full year 2019, we reiterate our prior guidance to expect device shipments to grow, driven by the introduction of lower-priced devices, which we execute on our strategy grow our community of active users. We expect smartwatches to exceed 50% of our total revenue, which while favorably impacting device unit growth, negatively impacts gross margin. Our Fitbit health solutions business is on track to deliver approximately $100 million in revenue for the full year with a growth rate in the high teens. In addition, we expect to grow our premium subscription service. As a result, we expect revenue to grow 1% to 4%, to approximately $1.52 billion to $1.58 billion. We expect gross margin to decline modestly for the full year to approximately 41%, trending higher in the second half, driven by operating leverage from higher revenue and improving product yield. This will be partially offset by a lower warranty benefit in 2019 compared to 2018 and device mix shift towards smartwatches. As the size of our Fitbit Health Solutions software services revenue increases that will favorably benefit gross margin given their higher gross margins in our consumer device business. For the full year, we expect to reduce operating expenses by 2 to 6% 2018 levels to a range of $660 million to $690 million. Our intent is to continue to drive efficiencies into the business through the ongoing optimization of our real estate footprint and redeploying capital to growing our Fitbit Health Solutions business and non-device consumer revenue. We expected adjusted EBITDA to be in the range of negative $30 million to break even. Despite the anticipated year-over-year -year improvement in operating income and lower capital expenditures, we will receive less benefit from changes in working capital than in 2018 and expect to consume approximately $40 million to $70 million of cash. 
We entered 2019 with accounts receivable approximately $100 million lower than we entered 2018. By 2018, we expect our free cash flow generation to be back in loaded and anticipate consuming cash in the first half of the year, generating cash in the second half. Because of the timing of collection varies, we expect to optimize to an annual free cash flow figure rather than on a quarterly basis. We expect capital expenditures to decline year over year to approximately 3% for the full year as we shift to less capital intensive development to consolidate our real estate footprint. Moving to taxes, we expect our full year effective tax rate to be approximately 30%, though this could fluctuate substantially depending on the geographic distribution of earnings. We expect full year stock based compensation expense to be approximately $83 million and a basic share count of approximately $260 million. Our balance sheet remains robust. Looking forward, we will augment organic investment with targeted M&A. We expect M&A will continue to play an important role at Fitbit and plan to target technology and talent acquisitions and businesses that accelerate the transition of our business toward digital health and recurring revenue. Turning to Q2, our guidance reflects the introduction of three new tracker products in Q1 and a more challenging smartwatch comparison with the successful launch of Fitbit Versa last year. We also expect FH revenue growth to decelerate from the high Q1 growth rate. As a result, we expect revenue to grow 2 to 7% on a year-over-year basis to a range of $305 million to $320 million. We expect second quarter gross margin to be between 36 and 38 percent. Second quarter gross margin typically expands from Q1, where our revenue increases and yields to begin to improve from our new product introduction. We expect adjusted EBITDA to be in the range of a loss of 59 to 47 million dollars, and we expect a net loss of 20 to 17 cents per share. Our guidance reflects an effective tax rate of approximately 25 percent which will vary depending on the mix of domestic and international revenue, and a basic share count of approximately 258 million shares. Stock-based compensation expense is expected to be approximately $21 million. Our 2019 revenue growth is front-end loaded, as smartwatch revenue growth favorably benefits total revenue growth. However, as we move into the back half of the year, year year-over-year growth comparisons become more difficult. We feel good about our Q1 results, but given the inherent volatility and the back-end loaded nature of our consumer device business, we believe it is prudent to maintain our full-year guidance for revenue growth of 1% to 4%. We expect a typical fall product launch and are confident in our product pipeline, but remain prudent given the changing competitive landscape. With that, let me turn the call back to the operator to answer questions. Operator? Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Once again, press star 1 to ask a question at this time. And we will take our first question from Scott Skrull with Ross Capital. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Nice quarter. Thanks for taking my question. Hey, maybe just for starters, I'm not sure if I heard correctly, Ron, but did you say non-hardware revenue of 1% in a quarter? And I'm wondering how that kind of filters into your expectations uh, for health solutions over the course of this year. Um, and along with that, uh, I was wondering if you could address the Inspire product portfolio within to that channel. There had been a lot of talk previously uh, with some of your product cycles and driving costs down to be able to hit price points where health payers and providers would actually subsidize the distribution and adoption of that given the health benefits that you see with a lot of diabetes programs and otherwise that you're talking about. Um, Are we starting to hit those price points and what are the expectations that are kind of filtered into your expectations for the second half of this year? Yeah, so Scott, on your your first question uh, regarding um, the uh, non-device revenue, um, it was about 1%. Um, you know, that's kind of across both, both pieces of the business. What I would say is that's fairly consistent with what we saw last year. As we continue to focus on, you know, the rollout of Fitbit Care, uh, we would expect that percentage and to grow the services side of the business and the, the health business. And as we launch a premium subscription service in the second half, we would expect that also to increase our non-device revenue uh, mix in the second half. Yeah, and on the healthcare side, your question around um, the, the affordability of the devices. So, 
uh, clearly inspire and inspire HR uh, resonated really well with uh, our, health, our healthcare customers. Um, you know, Fitbit devices are now a covered benefit uh, for a lot of 2019 Medicare Advantage plans in 27 states, and so um, that's being paid for by the CMA plan. Gotcha. And if we could just follow up quickly, and then I'll get back in the queue. Inventory seemed like it was a little bit up uh, this quarter. Um, I know given the product launches and otherwise, anything else to be read into that? Because it sounds like certainly we're on the trajectory of, of higher yields, better utilization in, in terms of that impacting product gross margins in the second half. Your thoughts kind of on inventory, and I'd love to hear your latest thoughts on a buyback. Thank you. Uh, so on the inventory levels, yeah, we, they were up slightly. A lot of that has to do with, you know, the product launches that came right toward the end of the quarter. Uh, but broadly speaking, we believe inventory uh, levels in the channel, uh, you know, and, and um, are healthy uh, and kind of at the levels we would like them to be going into the product. I think when it comes to, you know, a stock buyback, we, we continue to evaluate it. Um, you know, our priority is really to preserve our opportunity to invest in growth. Um, you know, we – continue to be you know, very disciplined in our approach to M&A, but we do look at it as an opportunity to deepen our relationship with our customers, grow our long-term value, uh, particularly with a focus on bolstering our services business and extending our reach into healthcare. Hey, hey, maybe if I could, Ron, just in, in terms of the the uh, non, non-hardware model and opportunity, when are we going to be able to get some more visibility into um, how you're thinking about monetizing, particularly along the healthcare line, in those premium subscription services. Are we going to see more in the second half of this year? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think your question, and I can let James talk a little bit more about kind of what we're seeing right now, but you know, we expect to launch some programs in the second half, and that should provide a lot more visibility in terms of exactly how we're looking to monetize um, you know, services and monetize you know, our you know, over 27 million active users. Uh, we're currently you know, testing and iterating, moving toward a second half launch. Great, thank you. Yeah, nice quarter. Yeah. We will take our next question from Jeffrey Rand with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, can you talk a little bit about the size of the addressable market in the healthcare space over the next few years and kind of how this splits out between hardware and software? Yeah, so right now our revenue for a healthcare business is predominantly devices. Um, and you know, our strategy there has been really about trying to increase the affordability of those devices, and you saw that with Inspire and Inspire HR. Um, and you know, that drive towards affordability, as I mentioned before, has allowed employers and health plans to heavily or fully subsidize these devices for their employees or their health plan members, including our win uh, in a lot of the Medicare Advantage plans in the United States. Um, over time, though, you know, we relaunched Fitbit Care last year, and we do expect that to be uh, a much more meaningful part of the healthcare revenue stream over time. We're beginning to see a lot of good traction. In fact, uh, three national health plans um, are currently using Fitbit Care as their means for uh, diabetes and diabetes management, other chronic disease condition management uh, for their members. Great, thank you. And just as a follow-up, um, do you think you have the sales force in place to kind of build out this healthcare market, or do you think that's something that you'll have to kind of invest in going forward? Yeah, we're, we we continue to invest in the sales and marketing capability of our healthcare business, and I think the interesting thing to note is that it's not just a U.S. opportunity, but a global one as well. In fact, the performance of FHS in the first quarter, where we saw 70% year-over-year growth was driven both by strong execution in the U.S., along with, um, you know, increased growth internationally as well. Great. Thank you. And the other thing I wanted to reiterate was our Q1 performance for FHS gives us even greater confidence that we'll hit our $100 million uh, revenue uh, target for 2019. We'll move next to Mark Robinkrantz with Craig Hallam Capital Group. Please go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my questions. I uh, wanted to ask a little bit more on the Fitbit Health Solutions pipeline. You, know, you mentioned you added three major co- companies during the quarter. You know, just wondering if you see the opportunity more in terms of adding more companies or getting deeper or, you know, exposing different devices across the SKUs or just kind of the, the general pipeline there. Yeah, I can't, can't talk too much about the pipeline, but, um, you know, I just wanted to clarify it. It's, 
it's not companies that we added, it's, it's health plans, which is a major difference since health plans have, um, you know, a much, much larger set of members versus a typical company with, you know, their number of employees. Um, a lot of our focus right now is towards health plans, and I think, you know, that's why you're seeing a lot of the wins there uh, that we're getting is on the health plan side. Okay, great. That's helpful. And then on the tracker side, just wondering, you know, with the introduction of the Charge 3 and some of the, the newer devices you've put out, are you seeing any type of changes in, you know, the active user base in terms of, you know, any type of difference in steps or just user activity in general with a kind of a newer audience on the newer devices? So I think our demographic is, um, you know, staying uh, pretty much the same across the entire portfolio. I would say that the one difference that we saw was with Versa Lite, where it is attracting a much younger audience, and that was the goal of that product, and part of our strategy to bring new users onto Fitbit. Um, I think the other interesting t thing to note is that uh, Inspire and Inspire HR were highly successful in bringing new users onto our tracker portfolio, um, which shows that with continued innovation and a drive towards affordability, the tracker category actually has room to grow, um, even with new users. Great, congrats, Ken, on a good quarter. And moving next, we'll go to Katie Huberty with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Thank you. Congrats on, on the revenue growth this quarter. I, I believe I heard you say that Versa Light sell-through was a little lower than expected. Can you talk about why you think that was? And with channel inventory healthy more broadly, is it also where you want it to be for, for that product? And I have a follow-up. Yeah, so we did go in with high expectations for Versa Light, especially as it was targeted towards a younger and you know newer demographic for us. And it did have lower than expected sell through. Um, but from our point of view, it's still pretty early for that product. It's something that's entirely new. We're continuing to build awareness. Uh, it started off uh, out of the gate. Really great customer and press reviews uh, have been really positive. And right now we're shifting media spend to periods of higher conversion to drive sell through of the product, including uh, Mother's and Father's Day. I think the benefit that we've seen with VersaLite so far is that it's increased overall awareness and helped drive the growth of our overall smartwatch portfolio, which is up 117% year over year. The other interesting thing, too, is that related to that, we saw less cannibalization of Versa and Charge 3. Uh, I think there's significant opportunity as well for our smartwatch portfolio uh, because we do see that 70% of our active users are still on legacy devices. So there's a significant upgrade opportunity. And then back on, on the health solutions business, beyond affordability and price points, are there also features that you consider to be killer apps in the future that can really increase penetration of the, the population within the health plans that you've signed up? Yes, for sure. Um, there's a lot of work that we're doing on the R&D side around health-specific features. Um, so, for instance, on the FDA side, we continue to collect and gather a lot of clinical uh, data to test and develop FDA-cleared solutions around health and disease conditions like AFib, sleep apnea, and other health conditions, which we hope to introduce soon. And we're maintaining a continuous dialogue with the FDA throughout that process. So I think, you know, that's a taste of uh, you know, some of the innovations that can occur to drive further growth in our category. And then just lastly, as it relates to the premium service you expect to launch in the back half of the year, is the timing uh, tracking to what you thought three months ago and, you know, any guidelines as to, you know, what you think the uptake of that service might be in the installed base over the first 12 months? Yeah, so just stepping back a bit, um, just to give a, give people a, a better picture of, you know, our vision for a soft service offering, you know, what we plan on launching over time is a service that uses all of your Fitbit data and select third-party data to screen and diagnose their users or health conditions, giving them deeper insights and analytics about their health, and ultimately giving them guidance and coaching to directly address their health, issue, uh, health issues or to reach their their wellness goals, and we think we're uniquely positioned to offer this for users 
and uh, you know we're we're still on track. We're making steady progress for a launch later this year. We're continuing to test and iterate. Uh, we're actually going to be broadening our testing over the next uh, several months to get additional feedback. Again, we're well on track to launch version one of our service vision uh, later this year. And Katie, I just wanted to get back to one of your earlier questions, just in terms of inventory levels with respect to Versa Lite. Um, you know, inventory levels are in line with where we want them to be for Versa Lite. Okay, great. Thank you. Moving next, we'll go to Jim Suba with City. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. And I have two questions, and I'll ask them at the same time, and we can answer them in the order you want. Um, can you comment on your strength in international markets? Um, I assume it was uh, attractive new product launches, but also in those markets, I would say, especially in Asia, there's a lot more competing devices. Are you seeing, you know, your installed base grow there, or what's kind of due diligence that you've seen that really helps out with that growth um, in the international markets. And then my second question is on ASPs. I, I think it's correct they were about $91 this quarter. With the launching of the kind of lower price point trackers, like for children, my kids, and stuff like that, is it fair to say that as the year progresses, the ASPs could come actually um, a bit lower, but yet those are higher profit margins? And is that the way to think about it? Thank you. Yeah, so this is Ron. I think on your on your first question, I think some of the strength international, I think was was you know broadly. And I think some of the strength we saw, you know, just in terms of demand in the U.S. was driven by new product introductions. Uh, you know, the strategy of launching more accessible devices uh, was a significant contributor to the growth in units. More specifically, when you look at EMEA, we're seeing a recovery in the U.K. market, um, and then broadly, um, you know, increasing demand with the new products. I think what you saw in the U.S. is some of that was impacted by really just the timing of sales uh, in the U.S. Um, I think back to the second question on ASPs, um, first off, I think the, you know, the decline that we saw in Q1 was expected and in line with our Q1 product introduction strategy, was specifically driven by the introduction of the more affordable devices, Inspire, Inspire, HR, and, and Versa Lite. Uh, designed to lower the barriers to joining our community and increase active users, which we saw in the quarter. Um, this doesn't mean that all of our new product introductions will fall into the category of sort of more affordable devices. While we do expect a decline in Q2 ASPs, driven somewhat by product mix and new product introductions, the rest of the year will fluctuate based on uh, the timing of new product introductions. I think as we've talked about before, when you look at, you know, gross margins, you know, one, lower priced devices don't necessarily mean uh, lower gross margins. You know, more specifically, uh, you know, while Q1 margins were low, driven, driven primarily by the seasonally low revenue, we are on track uh, to see progression and improvement of gross margins throughout the year uh, and up to our uh, full year expectations of approximately 40% on the gross margin side. And to provide some further detail on Ron's comment, if you look at our entire product roadmap um, you know, today in our portfolio, you know, we have devices ranging from close to $50 to $300, and we do expect that to maintain that price range across our entire portfolio. So again, as Ron mentioned, the ASPs are really going to uh, depend on the timing of NPI. Great. Thank you so much for the details. It's much appreciated. Next, we'll go to Jeff Garrow with William Blair & Company. Yeah, good afternoon, and thanks for taking the questions. I'd like to ask about FHS and the, the pipeline and selling season, maybe in a, in a different way. I do think of Q2 and Q3 as the main selling season for, for health plans and employers. So I wanted to ask if there's anything you can point to in terms of reference accounts or, or building out the network of partners that's resonating with prospects. Yeah, you know, for us, actually, you know, a lot of the, the selling comes in the second half of the year, and we start to see that benefit in the first half of the year. Um, that's, you know, typically how we see the plan and benefit cycle working for us. 
Uh, and so, you know, our comments around there is growth in the healthcare business for us is skewed towards first half, but you can still expect to see a high teens growth rate for the full year. Um, and again, we're still on track to hit our $100 million revenue target. Yeah, maybe to, to follow up on that further, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about, you know, the the new health plans and selling in front of or building out relationships in front of open enrollment and the, 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 the next year plan starts. So thinking about what's going to, to drive FHS growth in, in 2020 and how over the summer you're going to to help build those relationships to generate revenue from new members that those that those customers, those plans have starting, you know, January 1 of 2020. Yeah, so we continue to have really good high-level engagement with um, a lot of the key national health plans and a lot of the regional blues as well. Um, myself and the, the senior members of our healthcare business do regularly meet with the senior management of a lot of our key partners and future partners as well. Um, and so, you know, a lot of our growth uh, and interest is being driven not only by the continued, uh, you know, focus on affordability of our device portfolio, but there's a lot of interest in our Fitbit to Care product as well, as you can see by the fact that there's already three national health plans who've adopted it as their chronic disease management platform. Great, that's that's really helpful. Maybe one more for me. You know, I, again, on, on FHS and, and your work with health plans, and you talked about health plans using Fitbit devices and software for diabetes management. Um, curious how the, the health plans might be using it differently than Solera, the, the example that, that you gave during the script, and, and then also any, any earlier thoughts on, on how um, that same model or similar models can work with different disease states beyond diabetes. Yeah, so, you know, our partnership with Solera is, is fairly complementary. Um, Solera is a marketplace, and we offer – uh, a solution for diabetes. So the way that you know, Fitbit Care works is that, you know, it's a platform where we ingest data from not only our devices, but third-party uh, sources, such as from glucometers. Um, there's a triage element where uh, our health coaches can see users' data and then guide health plan members or employees uh, to meet their goals around lowering A1C levels or their blood pressure readings et cetera. Um, and so that's that's the offering that we're selling. And, you know, Solera is one of our partners that helps us reach uh, a lot more customers. But, so again, you have a, a diabetes example. Other other disease states that you're addressing now or, or think you can address through that combination of software and hardware in the future? Yeah, so right now it's, it's definitely diabetes um, along with hypertension, but there is an opportunity to extend that to other chronic disease conditions, as, for instance, sleep disorders or mental health, which are key areas of interest for companies in health. Great. Thanks for taking the questions. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, it is star one if you'd like to ask a question. We'll move next to Elliot Alper with DA Davidson Companies. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the question. Uh, so we're seeing politicians campaigning with healthcare as a primary to topic of conversation. How do you see the current regulatory environment for healthcare in the U.S. and what are the opportunities for that to be a catalyst to sales? Thank you. So I think the positive tailwinds for us is the recognition that outcome based healthcare is where everyone wants to go through. I mean, it's still a long journey to get to that point, but that coupled with the fact that, um, you know, the better we can manage how people prevent or manage some of these expensive chronic disease conditions that are driven by lifestyle factors such as diabetes and high blood pressure, I think there's a recognition that by doing that, there's a good opportunity, a great opportunity to lower healthcare costs. So I think all of that uh, you know, translates into a positive tailwind uh, for our healthcare business and our focus areas, which is, again, why we see a lot of interest from health plans in using Fitbit Care to manage chronic disease conditions for their members. Great, thank you. And next, we'll go to Charlie Anderson with Dowdy and Company. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, thanks for taking my questions. I wanted to go back to some of the verse to light commentary. I guess I'm I'm curious, embedded in your full year guide, which you didn't change, are you assuming that you sort of recover from the, the start that you had with some of these targeted marketing programs, or is it the case that other parts of the business are outperforming to kind of offset, and then I've got to follow up? Yeah, so I'll comment on, on Versa Light. So, uh, you know, it's still early in the life cycle of that product. It's, it's really a new product in the eyes of consumers, and so it's something that we need to build awareness on. So. You know, we had a good start again with the customer and press reviews. It's a, it's a well-reviewed product, and you know a lot of what we uh, are expecting to see in terms of sell-through is going to come from, again, focusing and shifting our media dollars to key periods like Mother's, Mother's Day and Father's Day. Again, um, you know, I think the great thing about Versa Light, as I mentioned before, is that it's driven overall awareness of our smartwatch portfolio. We actually saw less cannibalization of other products. Great. And then for a follow-up, just on the smartwatch category, um, you've got multiple price points now within that Versa family. I'm kind of curious where you see some, sort of the white space in the category. You know, what portions of the market are you not addressing at this point? The, you know, you did mention, I think, back half products. So just kind of curious, you know, where, where, where the room in the market is for you to, um, to grow the TAM. Thanks. Yeah, so I think if you look at our, our product uh, and price range from close to $50 to $300. Um, you know, that's the range that we'll continue to operate in. And in terms of specific price points, I think, you know, from my my perspective, we're pretty well covered. So I don't – shouldn't anticipate anything radically new on, on uh, where, where our products are priced. Great. Thanks so much. And, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, this does conclude today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.